Hi, everyone. I'm back. OK, so um, uh, welcome to the last day of the uh, Pathway Workshop. It's nice to see everybody. Um, so today, I'm going to be talking about gene function prediction. Really, what I'm going to be talking about is a specific tool called Gene Mania. And what we designed the tool uh, for, uh, we being myself and Gary Bader, is, is we designed it uh, as a way of giving people access to all of the genomics and functional genomics and proteomics data that's been generated over the last 10 years for the model organisms to make use of that to help you in your research without having you to have a PhD in computer science, essentially, to use it. And so, so how did we do that? Um, so first, I guess maybe I'll tell you about the outline. So the outline is um, the first thing to, uh, to understand is, is in order to use all this data that's been generated, we need this this concept of something called a functional interaction between genes, right? And that concept remains the same across all the different types of data that's been generated over time. And we'll go through all the sort of different types of, uh, of data that have been generated. And once you have uh, defined this concept of a functional interaction network, then you can say things about uh, predicting gene function, right? Either for a single gene or for multiple genes. And that's what we think this data is most useful for. And I'll show you some ways in, in which you can make use of the data in your own research. All right. And so there's some concepts in gene function prediction that I, that I want to quickly go over. Um, guilt by association, gene recommender systems. And then uh, I'm going to explain about gene mania. I'm going to show you a short gene mania de uh, demo. We have two things. We have a website for people to use. And that's the, that's the way I use it most of the time because it's easy to use. You can you know, do a quick query. But if you want to do like really hardcore stuff and you want to analyze large gene lists, we also have a Cytoscape plugin, which everybody has already installed on, on, their, on their thing. It has the same functionality as the website. It can deal with slightly larger gene lists. But the other thing is, is it's integrated into the whole Cytoscape framework so you can use other tools on networks that you generate using Gene Mania. Okay? And then so we'll have a lab today. We'll be, we'll, we'll be using the, the Cytoscape plugin to, to do an analysis. Okay, and then finally, there's a few like technical details that I that people always ask questions about that I'm I'm, I'm going to explain. Those sort of network weighting schemes will become clear what that is in a second, and then I'm going to introduce you briefly to uh, another tool that does something similar to Gene Mania um, called String. Okay, so so the question is, how do you use all this genome-wide data that people have been generating over the last decade or so in the lab? Now, what makes this difficult is there's all sorts of different types of data. So there's the genetic interaction data, there's protein-protein interaction data, there's pathways that people have generated, there's protein domain similarity, there's, you know, there's, there's chip data, so there's protein DNA interaction, there's a whole, whole lot of microarray expression data. They're all different kind of data modalities. They have this problem that makes them different than a lot of data that people are used to working with in that they're a little bit noisy. So there's false negatives, there's false positive interactions. And so how are you going to make use of that? And the idea simply is, is that you take each one of these data sets and you define something called a functional interaction between genes. So what's a functional interaction? Functional interaction is evidence that these genes share some function or do similar things. Right? Now that could be a little bit complicated because genes are multifunctional. So they could be sharing different aspects of their function. But if you overlay all the different functional interactions together, which you should hope ultimately is that the genes that really do have a strong shared function uh, will have functional interact will show functional interactions under a lot of different circumstances. And that's essentially the concept that we're using to make use of this data. I'll make this concept a little bit clearer as, as I give the presentation. Okay, so so the idea of functional interactions, well, one of the places they came from is, is from one of the first large-scale microarray data sets. And so what happened here? So this, is, this was published, this is data that was published in yeast, um, and the analysis uh, that I'm showing the picture of here was from 1998. And essentially what they did is they took a microarray expression profile uh, of yeast cells for all the genes, or for some subset of the genes, and those are listed in this heat map down the rows, under a set of different conditions that represents uh, different types of environmental stress. And then they just clustered these expression profiles. And what they discovered was that genes with similar expression profiles were annotated with similar functions. 
right? Which was a very nice discovery, right? Because then you can use that information then to say things about genes that you don't know the function of, right? And so one of the ways that you can represent that is represent this as, as, as just a network, where each gene corresponds to a node, and the links between genes, their weight corresponds to the, the strength of evidence, in this case, in the co-expression data, that they share a function, which you get maybe from correlation, okay? And then the idea being simply that if you find a cluster of nodes that are all very strongly linked together, three of which you have known function for, maybe this one you should say it's cell cycle based on this observation. And then three of which down here um, you know function for, maybe this gene is involved in protein degradation. Now you wouldn't necessarily say this alone for one microarray data set, but you see the same thing over and over and over and over again that starts to give you confidence that what you're looking at is real. Okay, and it's certainly a way of generating hypothesis about gene function. Okay, so when I talked about functional prediction and interacting with all these data in this following way, there's actually two types of questions that you can ask, right? The number one question is, what does my gene do? I have some gene, I'm, I don't really, you know, it's shown up in some, like, uh, screen, for example. Maybe it's, a, it's got a SNP that's associated with some disease that I care about. Can I find out anything about its function by saying, seeing what other genes it has a lot of functional interactions with? Okay, and there's another type of question, and that's if you're trying to, say, set up a small cell screen, and that's like, I have a list of genes that I know have some shared functions. Say they're all involved in the Wnt signaling pathway. Can you find me more genes like these genes? Right, and those are two different types of questions. Both of those types of questions you can ask of the gene mania interface and, and other uh, what I call gene recommender systems. Okay. So what does my gene de do? So the way, the, the way this analysis works is you take all the network and profile data that, that's been generated over the last few years, you put it all together in some way, you have a query list that consists of the one gene that you care about, you put this query list together with the network and profile data, you find genes that have a lot of functional interactions with, uh, with this single gene, and then you take that set of genes and you do an enrichment analysis to find out what functions or what pathways are enriched in the genes that this one is interacting with, right? And then what I'm showing here is a network that was actually generated on the, uh, on the Gene Mania website. You can generate similar networks in the plugin. And then I've just colored nodes by the most enriched function, right? So here, this is whatever that says, okay? Okay, so then the second type of question uh, you know, this is great and everything, but genes are multifunctional. And you might be asking different things about what the gene does. You might want to know what's my, uh, what its biological function is involved in is, or you might want to know what its biochemical function is. And those are sometimes two different things. Sometimes you want, might want to know where it's localized in the cell, which does tell you something about its function, but is not exactly the same thing. You can think of this as like, you know, in terms of how the gene ontology splits up gene function into like biological process, molecular function, and cellular component. But then also, there's also, I mean, you know, we know of a lot of genes that, uh, that have a lot of different functions. So, so you can think about this in the following way. Um, I came up with this when I was uh, giving this talk in Memphis, Tennessee. Right, so if you just say Memphis and you say, give me more cities like Memphis, well, nobody knows how to answer that question until you give them a little bit more context, right? So if I say, give me more cities like Memphis, Knoxville, and Nashville, well, you have these, uh, these other two cities, which uh, they are there in Tennessee, uh, believe me. But if you say Memphis and these, uh, these Alexandria and Cairo, well, then you're talking about Memphis and Egypt, right? So, so the list, your query list can define the question that you're asking, right? So, so give me more genes like this allows you to ask a more specific question that's defined by your query list, right? And so, again, it's the same sort of thing. You take all the network and profile data, you take your gene list, plug it into the gene recommender system, and it gives you the network that connects together these genes. It also gives you genes that are uh, well connected to this gene set here. But now that you've defined the query list, the gene mania or the gene recommender system, it can do something a little bit different. Um, it can figure out what type of data is more, most relevant to the question that you're asking. If you just give it one gene, it doesn't know what question you're asking. So it has to kind of weight the, all the data the same way depending upon which, uh, that doesn't depend upon which gene you give it, right? But if you give it a list, it can 
say, okay, well, you know, in this case, microarray data is more relevant than physical interaction data. So let me give you a more specific example, right? So, so if you're interested, for example, in a biological process that a gene uh, is involved in, say that gene is a, a gene that responds to salt stress, right? So, you know, possibly the most relevant data to try trying to figure out what genes are the ones that respond to salt, uh, salt stress are ones where there's a microarray time series that stresses the cell using salt, right? And so presumably some of the genes that are already known to respond to cell stress will respond to the salt stress. And then other genes that respond to salt stress will have correlated expression patterns with those. So in that case, the microarray data on salt stress might be the one that comes up as the most relevant to the question. Now, on the other hand, if you're interested in what protein complexes the gene is involved in, well, presumably the physical interaction data is going to be the one that's going to be the most relevant to that question, right? So, so in this, uh, under, you know, under this kind of made-up example that I've come up with, if your query list consists of genes that respond to salt stress, the gene recommender system can identify the fact that, okay, well, what is it about this query list that is the same? And you might be able to identify the fact that they're all co-expressed in this one data set. Or if that query list instead is parts of this protein complex that you're interested, it gives it the ability to identify that what's similar about the genes in the query list is that they're all connected in a physical interaction data set. Okay. And so, yeah. So um, gene mania does both of those things. So uh, essentially, I mean, I'll show you in a second. But you, you first of all, you say, okay, these are the interactions that I think might be relevant, and then of those interactions, gene mania determines which ones are most relevant. So you can control that, but you don't need to. But the thing is, is of course, if you if you provide more information about what you think is relevant, it makes its guessing task easier. So it's more likely to get it right. Okay. All right. So again, here's the interface. Um, I guess this means that I'm, this is where I'm supposed to stop and give you an example. Okay. So let, maybe that's what I'll do. Okay. So here's the website. It's just type in Gene Mania, and so you get to you. Right now, we we um, uh, we provide this for eight different model organisms. So you can just choose the model organism that you're interested in. Let's say we're interested in yeast for some reason. OK, and in this box, you type in your gene lists. Right? You can also copy and paste over from Excel. Um, I don't want to type in the gene list, so I can just like type in genes. And it looks up, and then the check mark tells you whether or not um, it's actually in the database. We do our best to identify any gene identifiers that people use. We, can't, uh, we don't identify probe set identifiers. But we do try to identify all the, you know, we use gene symbols. Uh, we, we can find ontogene IDs. We can find ensemble IDs. There's a lot of different gene IDs. Now, but the way we do it, the identifier has to be unique. It has to refer to only to one gene. And there's a surprising number of identifiers that aren't unique. And the other thing is, is that it has to refer to a protein coding gene at this point. It can't refer to a pseudogene. It can't refer to a gene whose status is uncertain. It can't refer to non-coding RNA yet. I mean, we're working on that. But right now, it's only protein-coding genes that are confirmed to be protein-coding genes that we recognize. OK, and then you can also, just to make your life easier, you can press this example, and it gives you an example gene list here. OK, um, and there's an advanced options panel that allows you to select which networks and what network weighting. And we're going to go over that in the talk in a second. I'm going to close that off and ignore it for the time being, just to give you the example of, um, of an analysis. So now I press the Go button. And so because I give it a gene list, what Gene Mania is doing is it's taking all the yeast data that I said is relevant, and we have a default set of networks that we use. And then it's asking what networks are most relevant to the specific question I'm asking by the gene list. And it answers that question by, uh, by finding the networks where this gene list is highly connected to one another, but not really connected to other genes outside the list. Right. And then it weights those networks based on this measure. Uh, the networks are grouped into different types of data. So these are genetic interactions. These are physical interactions. 
This is other, so there's other types of data here. So this is, these are genes that are appear uh, uh, often together in PubMed abstracts. These are um, genes that are respond similarly to chemicals. You can find out more information about where the network comes from by opening up this box and clicking through to PubMed. And these weights reflect the, the relevance of the genes. Okay, so now here's your network. The, the black ones are the genes that were in the query list. The gray ones are the other genes that are most connected to those. And if you open up the functional function tabs, what it's done is it's already done a, uh, uh, genes, um, a Fisher's exact test for you to find gene ontology biological process categories that are enriched in this gene list. And then you can color the, the genes according to these categories. Okay. All right, so now that's you know, the basic way that the, uh, that the interface works. You can also find out more about the specific genes in the list. And you can go through here and this tells you all the enriched functions, and by um, going highlighting over the little box, it, it tells you the name of the specific function. So these are all the functions, the enriched functions that this gene is assigned to. These are enriched functions that that gene is not assigned to, but are enriched in the rest of the list. Okay. It's uh, the the interface is designed to be fairly intuitive, so um, you can play around with it, and often it works the way you want it to. Okay, so let's go back and I'll tell you some specific things about the way that the, uh, the interface works. Okay, Okay. so, so the first thing I did, I, I showed you the uh, advanced options panel that you can get from the query page. I opened it up and then I shut it quickly. But that's, this, in the advanced options panel, that's if you want to do, uh, answer your question, you want to only look for certain types of interactions. And in that case, you have uh, the interactions, they're grouped by different categories. So there's co-expression, there's uh, co-localization, there's genetic interactions, physical interactions, and so forth. There's also this new type of interaction that we put up there called attributes. And those are the pathways that the gene is assigned to. And you can use those pathways to try to predict more genes like those. Right? And those pathways themselves, they come from, um, actually Gary's lab has collected them as part of the pathways they make available for analysis through enrichment maps. So you open this advanced options panel by, by clicking that phrase here in the, in, the, uh, in the query screen. You can also get it from the, uh, from the network um, display. And then you can also, there's pre-selected sets of uh, networks. There's a default set, which is essentially all interactions that we trust and some proportion of the microarray co-expressions interactions. We don't include all of them because often they give redundant information. Or you can choose all networks, or you can choose no, uh, none of the networks. OK. So now, by clicking, the checkboxes turn on and off all the networks in a specific category if you click there. Right? And then the fraction here tells you which ones you've, uh, which ones you've selected. If you click through on here, that actually opens up and displays all the networks. Let me, um, maybe this will be easier to see if I, so here I just opened the advanced options panel from the network display. So here are all the different networks. You can turn the networks off. So there's zero of the one network in co-localization is, is selected. You can turn all the networks on. Or you can open this, uh, open this up and click on or off specific networks. And if you click on here, that tells you where the network came from. So you can click through to, to read the, uh, the PubMed listing. It also tells you sort of the source of the types of informa uh, information. And then we also tag the networks based on um, uh, keywords that were assigned to the networks in PubMed. So you have a lot of choices here. And so this is the attributes. Oh, OK, and these are interpro attributes. Let's, let's choose human. Let's use the example. So now in human, we have a lot more of uh, these attributes. So these are the pathways. You can look at drug interactions. You can look at microRNA target predictions and just have fun with that. OK. So I've already gone through this uh, by showing you the, it on the interface itself. 
Um, this is just for your notes so that you see how this works. Okay, so now is there, if there's any questions about the interaction with the website, maybe you could briefly answer them now, and then I'm going to talk to you about some, uh, some different aspect of the interface, which you need to understand, which is how the networks are weighted. Yeah. So you want to or you want to upload two different lists. Yeah. Um, to do. The only genes that would be set as genes would be uh, the ones from the uh, microarray on our seq and the only one that would be. Yeah. Um. I I would really like you to be able to do that. <laughs> um. And we're, this is something we're actually proposing to do. So we're asking for funding to to expand it in that way so that you can provide a background list. Um. It's extremely difficult to do that with the web interface. Um, you could try to do that with the Cytoscape uh, plugin by just sort of manually removing genes or overlaying genes in some way. And I, I cannot tell you how to do that um, myself, but if you email me, there's, uh, there's people in the lab who can tell you how to do that. Veronique, do you know how to do that? Okay. Oh, right, okay. Yeah, yeah, that's a great idea. Yeah, okay. Yeah. Um, what does the, the percentage mean? So when you have, when you have your network up there on the right hand side, it says list of things on the percent percentage. Does that mean what you get from it? It's the weight. So every functional interaction is associated with a weight. So if it's like co expression, that weight is derived from the Pearson correlation coefficient. Um, so, so when we compute the final network, we provide a, a weight to the functional interaction, and then the weight in a network, like the co-expression network, let's say it's like five, is multiplied by that percentage weight, let's say it's like 50%, so that becomes 2.5, and then we add up the weights from all the networks that are included to get the final functional interaction weight. Exactly, the composite network, yeah. yeah. Okay, more questions? Okay, so now, now I'm, I'm going to explain together, uh, explain to you how these weights that, that you see, they're computed. Okay, the, the reason that I'm going to explain this to you is you actually have some choices that you can make in the interface, and it's important for me to explain why, uh, like, how to make those choices. Okay. So then here's the idea, right? So you have three different types of networks in this case. You have to assign them all a weight, which is the reflection of like how much they're going to be used to, to generate the final network. How do you determine the, what those weights are? So the simplest possible thing that you can do is you can just assign them all equal weights. You can say, we don't know one way or another what's better, what network's better, and what network, and network's not better. So the problem is, first of all, not every network is equally useful for every question. Right? And so if I've given you more information by, about what question you're asking by giving you a gene list, obviously you should upweight the networks that are most relevant to that gene list. The other thing, so, and so here on this slide I've explained that by saying that the gene function could be a whole bunch of different things. The other thing that can happen is, um, right, so the other thing that can happen, and this, that, that's not only a question of relevance to the question, but some networks end up being redundant. And so what does that mean? Well, you know, often what happens, especially with microarray data, is there's different labs doing the same assay at the same time, right? So if you get like 10 data sets that are all querying one aspect of, data, of, of function for a set of genes, you don't want to assign them all the, the same weight as a, a different data set that queries some completely different function of genes, because then all your queries are going to be focused on that specific function, right? So if you just assign equal weight to every network, you're not taking advantage of the, uh, you're, you're, sorry, you're sensitive to that. And so we have two rules for network weighting. I mean, we use equations, obviously. But the two general rules are the network should be relevant to the question that you're asking. And it shouldn't be redundant with the other networks that are already there. Okay. 
And the, the way in which we assign those weights take, uh, takes into consideration both those two things. As we, we use linear regression, a, a specific type of linear regression to assign the weights, and it identifies, when it assigns those weights, it, it, those weights reflect both the relevance and the redundancy. Okay, and so, again, if you give us a long list, we can come up with query-specific weights that reflect uh, what networks are relevant to answering the question. Now, so by default, if you don't do anything, GeneMania selects between two different ways of doing the network weighting. One is query-specific, but it only uses that if your list is sufficiently long. I think it has to be five genes or six genes. Okay. The reason that, that is is if the list is shorter, we just don't have enough information. And so we're going to make like bad calls. We still might make bad calls if it's like five or six genes. But as the gene gets longer, you can become more certain that, that the query-specific weights are reflective of, um, of what you need. The other thing is that the gene list is short, or if you only give us one gene, we weight networks so that uh, based on their ability to uh, recapitulate the co-annotation patterns in gene ontology, right? So, if, so by that, what I mean is if, if the network tends to link together genes that are assigned the same function, it gets a greater weight, right? And as long as that weight is not redundant, that network is not redundant with some other network. So essentially, like you could think of the way in which we are computing the network weights is under this gene ontology-based weighting, is that we take all the gene sets in gene ontology, we compute the query-specific network weights for them, and then we average them together. Right? So that, so that the weight just reflects overall predictiveness for uh, biological process annotation. Does that make sense? So now, we do, by default, we use biological process, because that's what most people are asking. But you can switch over to molecular function, or you can switch over to cellular component. And then if for some reason you don't want to use any of these weighting techniques, there's a, the last category, which is equal weighting. So you can equal weight by data type. So you can say, I, the, the weight that I'm going to assign to all the co-expression networks in total is going to be same as the, uh, the weight that I assign to all the uh, co-complex networks. So if there's like 10 co-expression networks and one co-complex network, each of those 10 will get one-tenth the weight of the one co-complex network. Or you can just assign equal weights to all the networks. So those are your options in terms of network weighting. Um, if you're not happy with the automatic choice that we've made, you can change that choice. Okay. Okay. Um, one last um, little bit of... Um, um, explanation I'm going to give you is once we have the network, how we decide what genes are the ones that are, interact the most with those in the list. Okay? And so let's say, for example, this is the network that we've come up with. It's not a very interesting looking network, uh, but this is the network. These are the genes that are on the query list. So those are the genes that define the question that we're ask, asking. And by color, I mean, I, I'm, I'm using the color to reflect how highly those genes are scored. Okay? So there's two main ways of, of scoring nodes. One is that for each of the nodes, each of the genes, you look at its neighbors, and you set its score to be the average of the score of its neighbors. So what does that do? Well, that means that this gene, which has one neighbor that's in the original list, is going to score less than this gene, which has two neighbors in the list, right? And then these genes get no score at all because they have no neighbors in the list, right? But what this, this type of scoring doesn't reflect is that, you know, these three, this group of three genes is not connected to anything in the list at all, but these genes down here have indirect connections to things in the list. And then, you know, under some circumstances, you might even have two genes that aren't directly connected, but have a whole lot of indirect connections. Right? So by indirect connections, I mean that there is a path of length 2 that goes between the two nodes. So this gene here is indirectly connected to this gene. It's indirectly connected to this gene by a path of length 2, and it's indirectly connected to that gene. 
Okay, so we want to reflect the fact that these two genes, even though they're not direct neighbors, they're in some sense closer in the network than these genes over there where there's no path from the, uh, from the genes in our query list. And these types of things are important, say, like if you're defining protein complexes. You don't, there's a lot of false negatives in these functional interaction networks, right? So if you have, say, if, for example, a protein complex, which you'd hope is that everything in the complex is going to be connected to each other by a direct physical interaction, but often it's not. But often they share a lot of the neighbors. They interact with the same sets of genes. And if you share a lot of neighbors, that's, that is often a better um, indicator that you share function than a direct interaction between uh, yourself and one neighbor. Does that make sense? Okay, so, so the method that we use in order to score genes once we have a network is called label propagation. And essentially what it does is it uh, reflects the difference between these two things. So, you know, you can think about it as, as, follow, as the following. You, you first compute the direct neighborhood. You score the genes in that way. And then you continue, and then you continue re-averaging the genes. So now you look at this gene, you take the average of it, neighbors, it's going to be a bit smaller. You look at this gene, you take the average of this, its labors, it's going to be a bit smaller. And none of these genes are going to be connected by any pass to these red genes here, so they're never going to get any score at all. You can think of it as heat flowing through a network with some like heat sinks that cause you to lose label in some way. Or you can think of it as paint running through a network. Okay. You don't have to understand the, uh, the algorithm itself. The important thing to understand is that it can distinguish between situations where genes just are indirectly connected to the query list and those where there's no connections at all. And it scores genes highly if they have a lot of indirect connections to the query list. Yes. Exactly. Yeah. So the problem with a lot of these like interaction networks that people define, there's false positives. So these are interactions that aren't real that get detected. But the uh, you know there's few of those. They're not that bad. But there is a big problem with false negatives. Interactions that should have been detected that but weren't connected detected. And so you know. There might be another network that gets uploaded at a different date that actually has that direct connection, or maybe that direct connection and never gets observed by anybody. But, but there's been various people who have noticed that when you have these false negatives, interactions that you should have uh, detected but you didn't, you can also often find signatures of them by the fact that the two things that should have been connected share a lot of their neighbors. And that's what we're trying to take advantage of with this algorithm. Precisely. Yeah. Yeah. So do you have examples of when this sort of approach would have been used to make sort of a low probability, non obvious prediction that would have then sort of independently verified? Um not I mean the uh I can give you citations. Yeah. Can you email me after and then I'll just give you some citations? No. So uh, I'm saying two things. If there's uh, genes that have more indirect connections, score more highly than genes that have few indirect connections. Uh, and the other thing that I'm saying is under some circumstances, if you have a whole lot of indirect connections, then you can score more highly than something that only has a single direct connection. Okay, great. All right, uh, and then there's some details here which, I, which I've already explained but might help you with your note taking. Okay. Right, so the take home is that the label propagation that we use, because it allows indirect links to query genes to impact the scores, often what happens is it'll pull up a whole cluster of nodes. Because clusters of nodes that have a lot of inter, uh, interconnections also have a lot of indirect connections with one another. Okay. 
Okay, so here's a label propagation example. So here's a, here's a, uh, uh, a network. And if you, before you run label propagation, it looks like this. After you run label propagation, it looks like this. You can see here that these uh, genes that all have a lot of connections with one, in, uh, one another, what they do is they, they strengthen the, their interactions, right? So these are all kind of high, right? But there's not very um, strong scores for the other genes, even though this gene here is in the original query list, right? And that's kind of important because there's a lot of genes in these networks that are, that are called hub genes. And hub genes, a, a lot of them are very multifunctional. P53 is a perfect example of this. So it's linked to a lot of different functions. So if you're linked to P53, you don't want to inherit all the functions that P53 has. You're linked to P53 because you share some aspect of its function. right? So by re also relying on these indirect connections, you can distinguish between direct connections that, that occur simply because you're linked to one of these pleiotropic genes, right, that have a lot of functions, and, and specific functions that, that uh, you know, genes that have a small number of functions have. Okay. Okay, so gene mania is, is three things. It's a large automatically uh, updated collection of interactions and networks. And that's what a lot of people use Gene Mania for, is they use it to actually download the networks that connect their gene set together. Right? So even if you don't want to use gene function prediction, you can still use Gene Mania for that. Um, it's a query algorithm that finds genes and networks that are functionally related to your gene list. Okay? And it also has this interactive client-side network browser with extensive linkouts. I love using the website because you know, what I do in talks is people mention gene and I type in a gene mania and then I, I try to guess what they're going to say the gene function is and I can go through and I can link through and see uh, all the other genes it interacts with. It's, it's, um, it's fun. Okay, and so where do the data sources come from? So we, we collect data from uh, a lot of different data sources. Right now we have uh, almost 2,000 networks in the gene mania um, uh, website and in the plugin. And so our co-expression data comes from Gene Expression Omnibus. We download all the gene expression data sets that come from a platform that we recognize and have a sufficient number of samples in them that we're confident that the co-expression values that we, uh, that we compute are relatively accurate. We, we get genetic and physical interactions from BioGrid or IREF index. So what IREF index does is people uh, who... Um, either generate large sets of physical interactions or people who go through and curate physical interactions reported in papers, they, they, they put their physical interactions into something called IREF, which is an overall um, body to kind of control the, the annotation of physical interactions. So we download what they generate. And we do the downloads about, we try to do them about quarterly, about once every three months, but often we end up doing it about once every six months. Okay, uh, we also get predicted interactions. So these are what are called enterologs. So these are interactions that have been observed between orthologs in a different species. Uh, we also uh, look at shared protein domains, and recently we've added attributes, and these are compiled by uh, Gary Bader's lab. Uh, and we also have some organism-specific databases that we use. And we get our gene annotations from gene ontology. We ignore electronic annotation because those are unreliable. Okay. Um, so one thing that I actually haven't talked about, if we're missing a network that you want, you can upload that network to our, to our database. And you, it, uploading the network is, is dead simple. Essentially, you just put it into an Excel spreadsheet. And each row is the two genes that interact. So say you have like 100 interactions, you have 100 rows, and each row you have the gene identifiers for the genes that interact. If you want, you add another column, which is the interaction score. If you don't have a score, we assume that it's, they're all, the, the interaction strength is all the same for all the genes. Right? You've got to output that Excel spreadsheet through tab-delimited text, and you can upload it, and then use that network in exactly the same way that you would use any of the networks that are already in our database. 
These are things you can do on the website. You can also do the Cytoscape plugin, and there's a lot. You have a lot more functionality in the Cytoscape plugin, so you can upload series of networks. You can make your own network databases, for example. Okay. Uh, one more thing I want to tell you about is gene identifiers. So we try to recognize all the unique uh, gene identifiers that we can. Uh, here's a list of the ones that we get. The problem, of course, is a lot of people call genes by names that are synonymous with other genes. Uh, and it's terrible. There's, uh, you know, there's something called SMG, which is, refers to two distinct genes in Drosophila. One is called smog, and I can't remember what the other one's called. There's a lot of situations where you're using an alias for a gene that's not unique. And because we want to simplify the input gene process, we don't ask questions to, to try to figure out what sense of the gene that you mean. We'll just identify cases where the alias is nonspecific. And, and then, then under those circumstances, you can go and try to look up another name for the gene that is unique. But besides that, we, ident we, we try to identify any identifier that people use, so you don't have to do this identifier mapping step. Okay. And the other thing is, is to get these identifier mappings, we use the Ensemble database, which we mirror. But again, we update about once every three months or every six, every six months. So it's possible that we're not going to recognize a gene that's in the Ensemble database because it's a new gene. And if that happens, just email us to let us know about it, and we'll try to do something for you. Okay, so currently we, 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 uh, uh, we have eight organisms. Which one is missing? Maybe we only have seven right now. Yeast. <laughs> All right. And we have about five, 2,000 networks. And we have the, uh, uh, the network browser. Uh, we're going to look at the Cytoscape plugin, though I encourage you to fool around with the network browser as well. Um, the other thing that we have we have a lot of offline command line tools to either like build up network bases for another organism, and people have certainly done that. Um, and they'll, so currently, once you build up those network databases for different organisms, you can access that through the Cytoscape plugin. Um, what we're trying to do now is we're trying to make it easier for you to set up those network databases and make your own Gene Mania instance for that organism. Right, but again, that's you know we're waiting for funding on that, and you know it would happen maybe in the next year or two years. But what we also have done is that we uh, we set up gene mania instances for people that we've collaborated with on specific organisms. So we um, so far we've set up instances that we're working on for like cricket. Um, we're uh, we're setting up an instance uh, with a. Um, uh, Gary set up an instance with a group at York, and I can't remember what organism it's some single cell um, eukaryote. Which? Yes. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, and so so there's there's that. Um, we're currently we're just about to release uh, Gene Mania for E. coli, which is surprisingly hard to set up. And we also have tools. What uh, one of them is called Query Runner, um, where you can evaluate how much your new network contributes to overall knowledge about functional interactions. Or you can make a series of gene function predictions for, all, for example, all the Go categories. And you can do that kind of offline to run these things and then assess them through cross-validation. OK. So, so our major competitor is the string database. They've actually been along, around for about seven years longer. Um, and string has much of the functionality that I, I've talked to you about already. The functionality that they don't have is they don't have different ways of weighting networks. Okay? And their focus is slightly different than our focus. But one thing that's very good about string is they cover a whole lot of different organisms. Right? So, so if you're not one, uh, if the organism you're interested in isn't one of the, the special eight, uh, string can probably help you. Okay. And so, these are the types of networks that you get out from string. I think I did a, a, I think my query gene here might have been rad 50. Right, you can see they have kind of a nice, uh, nice interface. They actually now use the network display tool that we developed for Gene Mania, um, or at least the, the, the Cytoscape web uh, plugin that we developed. And then actually, if you click through, uh, if there's a structure for the corresponding protein, you can click through and see that structure. 
they also, so you can see the, uh, like ours, the color of the links indicate the source of the evidence. And they're much better at tracking where individual, uh, uh, what ev individual ev evidence is for individual interactions. So you click through those interactions. In many cases, you can click through through the specific paper that reported the interaction, um, even if that paper only reported one interaction. We can provide that to you if the paper reported 100 or more interactions. But for like single interactions by like that were, uh, were reported in like a paper from 20 years ago, we're not going to be able to help you with that. Um, you know, they also give you the gene function predictive partners. Um, I don't think they use they do go enrichment yet, but they, they continue to do it. Uh, they have a much better representation of the text mining. So they're much better at recovering proteins whose names have been co-mentioned in PubMed abstracts. So they're very good for looking up what's going on in the literature and the literature associated with individual genes. The thing to know about string is they're protein focused. They're not focused on genes so much as they're focused on proteins. So for example, uh, we're focused on genes, so we, we include things like genetic interactions. We're a lot more permissive about the type of interactions that, that we, we permit. Because we have a very flexible way of doing network weighting, we can do a lot of things on the fly, we can allow you to upload networks. Any type of functional interaction we can incorporate. String is a little bit more specific about the type of uh, functional interactions that they allow, and that, that, might, um, that might give them maybe a little bit more, uh, I don't know. Um, and so what they do is they come up with eight pre-computed networks for each organism. These networks are com a combination of all the networks of that particular type put together. We have a little bit more flexibility that you can turn off or turn on some networks of the, of the database of thousands uh, that you want to be included in the query or not. So you have a little bit more precision there. Um, the last thing that's a little bit different is they use ge genetic uh, direct interaction to score nodes, so they don't do this label propagation that I've been talking about with the indirect connections. Okay, but nonetheless, there's no reason not to try the same query in string and try the same query in Gmania and see what you get, because the you, you know the types of things that we report are often complementary. Okay. All right, so E. coli. Uh, Hopefully that's coming soon. You can find it actually, if you want to play around with it, you just go to the beta site. You go beta.gmania.org. Uh, e. coli is actually up there right now. So if you, uh, if you like E. coli, you can fool around with it. Um, we, we don't include regulatory networks yet. Um, partially that has to do with the fact that I don't think they contain a lot of functional information yet. Um, and we want to incorporate more phenotype information, so disease associations of genes. And right now, we rely on other people to do our orthology mapping between organisms. And you know, as time goes on, we're going to start doing a lot of that orthology mapping ourselves. So we can, uh, we can map orthologist co-expression relationships, for example. OK, so these are the URLs.